Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Interesting Ideas. And oftentimes when I'm looking for interesting ideas, I sometimes find one from myself. I may go back to some of the things I've been thinking about, perhaps things I thought about a long time ago, maybe even things that I talked about, and all of a sudden I discover in kind of a reprise that that still has meaning, perhaps for me and maybe for you. So, with your permission, on this Sunday night, may I go back to the past and do a reprise, that's a fancy word for a rerun, of a program that I really appreciated. It's about, you know what, <laughs> Sunday nights are really important. Sunday night meetings are vital. And then there's the story, that wonderful story of the prodigal son. So once again, my friends, may we go back with an interesting idea, because this truly is for you. And it's a Sunday night. That's right, it's Sunday night, and... As we obviously say and many times proclaim, Sunday night's a time when you should uh, take a time out to have a Sunday night meeting to get ready for Monday meeting the marketplace. And uh, in the Sunday night meeting, you pray. You think about what God has in store for you in the week to come. You plan. You think. You energize. You organize. And uh, then you get ready to rest because on Monday you have to be ready to meet the marketplace. So I've encouraged people throughout the years, just simply at the end of the day, uh, relax, enjoy, uh, think about the worship time you've had, and then just simply as the evening begins to emerge upon you, light a candle, put on some good music, listen to the things that are important to you, get out your Bible, get a notebook, and then uh, do a Sunday night meeting. Well, today on the Sunday night meeting, I'd simply like to read you a little bit of a story that uh, I borrowed, copied, and found uh, very, very good. For those of us who are truly going into the marketplace on Monday as artists, as perhaps heroes, and of course, as Christian entrepreneurs. So, please join me. He cares for you. Yes, indeed, and uh, that's one of our newer theme songs that we're going to pick up occasionally. We still have our usually rousing radio on the edge theme that we use most of the time, but uh, occasionally we'll switch to this one. And actually, the story behind that is, as I mentioned just before, that my good friend Bob Ketcher, Sid, and I, who are longtime radio people, that we did a program uh, called Caribbean Night Call. And it was just that, a program that went through the night. And I've always loved late night radio. You know, the quiet, the musings, the uh, uh, realization that uh, people who are up obviously are having some issues about why they're up. At the same time, uh, they're trying to find some place and space, perhaps for a little peace and quiet. Uh, I just love Sunday night radio. And for years, my uh, uncle was very much involved he was a well-known church musician and organist and uh, actually was the organist for the Billy Graham Association for many years. You may have heard his name, some of you. His name was Don Houston. And he was part of a program that I think still may continue. But what they did is they actually did it live in those days, 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. 
Uh, they would all gather at their little church in a place called Western Springs, Illinois. It was called the Village Church. And they would do a live radio program called Songs in the Night. Songs in the Night. And it was just that. It was late night music. It was a consoling music. And uh, usually both a consoling and challenging message. And they just didn't put it on a little Christian station. That's fine. Those are good and wonderful things. But part of their challenge was they put it on a big 50,000-watt clear channel station in Chicago, Illinois, and it boomed all over the United States late at night. And uh, it still continues in some form, in some way, but uh, I really fell in love with listening to my Uncle Don and listening to the messages. And then late night radio always appealed to me. It still does. I can't stay up that late much anymore, but perhaps through the magic of uh, the Internet and uh, podcast recording, we can still at least place ourselves in that spot. What I want to do very simply is uh, just share. As some people would say, that means you're going to steal somebody else's stuff. Well, maybe that's true. One of the persons who's been very helpful to me is Stephen Pressfield, who is a writer and an author and an entrepreneur. And what is true is that oftentimes I've said that if you're an entrepreneur, you have to think of yourself as an artist, very much so, because you're creating works of art, works of experiences, works that will help people do their work better. So think of yourself in the metaphor as an artist, being able to sign your work just like a good artist would. And then, in some respects, you have to think of yourself that uh, you're going on a journey. And uh, it's going to be a dangerous journey. And you're going to have to be a, a little bit heroic to get through that journey. Because it's going to be a rugged time. And so what has happened is Stephen Pressfield has been writing about the artist. And the writer, particularly. But the writer and the artist, and I would add entrepreneur, in their heroic journey. And what he did is that he took The Prodigal Son and The Artist's Journey, which was a recent publication. And so with full thanks and grateful attribution, would you give me permission just to read Stephen Pressfield's or perform Stephen Pressfield's little work of art called The Prodigal Son and The Artist's Journey? And of course, the point is that it's not really about the prodigal son. It's about you, and it's about me, and it's about the prodigal's father. The prodigal son and the artist's journey. I remember when I was a kid reading the biblical story of the prodigal son, I never really got the point of it. I found myself siding with the elder son. Hey, Dad, what's the story? My younger brother takes his inheritance early and bolts from the farm, he swaggers into the big city, blows every penny on gambling and fast living, and then comes crawling home, begging for forgiveness. The kid's a bum! Yet here you go, Pop, breaking out the fatted calf and rejoicing at your wayward child's return, when I, the responsible one, have been here all along, busting my butt to make this farm pay. It ain't fair. Well, I didn't get the father's explanation either. Because he said, my son was lost, but now he's found. Stephen continues, I was thinking of this the other day, and I realized the story is the perfect expression of the hero's journey, the artist's journey, as a metaphor. And I would add, the entrepreneur's journey. The prodigal son's life of disillusion, his adventures in the flesh pots of the wicked city, was his hero's journey. He left the ordinary world, crossed the threshold into the inverted world. He encountered enemies and allies. He suffered. Finally, he hit bottom. And he did what the hero classically does. He returned home. But not as the same person he had been when he left. His ordeal had changed him. He came back, whether he knew it or not, bearing a gift for the people. Consider the father in the story. Who is he? Well, he's God. In some respect, he's kind of the God self-soul. 
Because God is in self, and the God is in your soul. He understands, even if the elder son doesn't at first. When the father considers his younger son returned at last to the place from which he set out, he reckons three things. First, the younger son will never leave again. The lad has sowed his wild oats. He's learned his lesson. The temptations of diversion and empty self-amusement no longer hold any allure for him. Number two, the younger son has finally found, or at least he's begun to find, his true identity and what he's really supposed to do. The youth now knows where he belongs. He has shed a thousand alternative identities. He has come home in the deepest and most telling sense of the phrase. And number three, now the younger son's creativity is about to be unleashed. The Bible story doesn't tell us what happened after, happily ever after. But let's venture an educated guess. Two months after the son returns home, he comes to his father and says, Pop, much as I enjoy tending the sheep and goats, the real area I'm drawn to is the olive groves. I don't know why, but I have a feeling I can make them grow better. That bare, stony patch up the hill, would you let me plant some seedlings there and see if I can make them flourish? Fast forward, 20 years later. The prodigal son has become the olive whisperer of the entire province. Growers come from miles around to learn his secrets of cultivation and propagation, care and tendance. In other words, again, he has found his true identity. He has located his gift. He has become himself to the benefit not only of his own life and that of his wife and his kids. Yeah, he found a nice girl and got married. Nice Jewish girl, but to the whole farm, including the share owned by his older brother. The younger son's hero's journey ended when he hit the bottom in Sin City and came home to the farm. At that point, his artist's journey, and I may add, his entrepreneurial journey has really begun. Of course, the family in the story is a metaphor for you and me, and for a single individual. The father, in many ways, is the representation of the soul given to us by God, the self given to us by God, God himself. And each son is a part of the whole, the stay-at-home, hard-working brother, and the wild child who crossed the threshold to the inverted world and lived out his saga of resistance before finally identifying his true journey and beginning to live it. If you'll forgive me for quoting myself, here's a passage from my book, Turning Pro, the chapter titled, Three Cheers for the Amateur Life. Before we begin ruthlessly deconstructing the amateur life, let's pause for a moment to give its due. The amateur life is our youth. It's our hero's journey. No one is born a pro. You've got to fall before you hit bottom. And sometimes that fall can be a hell of a ride. So here's to blackouts and divorces, to lost jobs and lost cash and lost self-respect. Here's to time on the streets. Here's to years we can't remember. Here's to bad friends and cheating spouses. And to us, too, for being guilty of being both. Becoming a pro in the end is nothing grander than growing up. And here's to you, if you're reading this, and your own term of prodigality, don't shortchange it. It's your initiation, your self-initiation. You paid for it, and it's yours. Keep it. It's okay to flash back to it from time to time while you're out there with your sons and daughters tending the olive trees on that once bare and stony patch that is now flourishing. You see, the father, the prodigal's father, dad, he understands. He always did. And so in the end, does your elder brother. 
And that's the end of the story. Let him who has ears, let him hear. Thank you, Stephen Pressfield, for your guidance for this Sunday night. Again, let him who is ears, let him hear. There's something about that story that strikes every last one of us. And I hope that from the striking of that story, as you set out on the week before you, that there'll be something there that will help you live well, share well, love well. And then, of course... As Jesus would love for it to happen, you will see him more clearly. Uh, you'll love him more dearly. And uh, you'll follow him more nearly. All the best and blessings. May your week go well. There will not be any Monday program because when I hit the marketplace tomorrow, boy, it's full. And I'll need all the time I can. So we won't see you until Tuesday. But remember what we learned on Sunday. All the best and blessings, and bye for now. Mm -hmm.